Hi, everybody. Um, so my name's uh, Mike Turquette. I'm with uh, Bay Libre. We're going to talk about uh, you know, making a driver subsystem from scratch today, sort of some lessons learned and a few war stories. Um, but I'll start off with who I am. I've worked at Texas Instruments, Lenaro, um, some cool San Francisco startup working on embedded Linux devices. And most of my contributions on the mailing list are around power management topics. Um, I wrote the uh, common uh, clock framework and merged that for 3.4. So there will be a lot of examples in this slide coming directly from, from that uh, subsystem, since that's what I'm familiar with. Um, so maintenance has been going on for over three years. I now have a co-maintainer, um, Stephen Boyd. And there were a lot of mistakes, rewrites, you know, a lot of, a lot of screw-ups. And so you guys will hopefully be the, the, the beneficiaries of these mistakes and their fixes. Um, and also, it's the first time I'm giving this talk, so you are all my guinea pigs. Thank you. And um, we'll start off with this gentleman here. So I'd like to get a little audience participation. Uh, please raise your hand if you recognize who this guy is. I don't expect very many people. I know I talked to Greg. Yeah, Greg, you're like the only one. Okay, great. So this is the most interesting man in the world. And um, if, you, if you Google search for him, uh, you, and if you search for most interesting man in the world meme, you'll see hundreds, if not thousands, of, of photos of this uh, style. And um, it's, he's from some famous uh, commercials in the United States. So maybe not the best audience for this guy. Um, but he has you know, good taste and good style. And, uh, and so I aspire to that. I cannot be as good as him. But this presentation is filled with lots of subjective uh, uh, opinions on what makes for good style with uh, device uh, uh, framework design. And so he'll pop up a few more times when a slide is particularly uh, sort of subjective and not really based on fact, but just my, my strong opinion. So the agenda, we're going to talk about what makes a good subsystem, some design considerations including design patterns or pitfalls to avoid, um, a really brief uh, overview of the actual common clock framework design, um, and then a, a few uh, slides on maintenance and being a maintainer afterwards. Please feel free to interrupt if you have questions or to disagree with me. Like I said, it's, some of this material is a bit subjective. So um, yeah, let's start off with what makes a good uh, driver subsystem. Um, so you know, a, a subsystem is like a, a framework or a library. It's some common code. It implements a behavior, a protocol, um, a, uh, an interface of some sort. Um, I use some terms. These are not official terms by any stretch. So I use terms like provider um, for a uh, Linux kernel driver, which you know plugs into the subsystem and provides access to the hardware. Um, I also use the term consumer, which are also Linux kernel drivers. These are on the consumer side of the API. Um, and a driver can be both a provider and a consumer. These are my own definitions. Um, I also sometimes use the word library, um, and we'll get into that, uh, what that means a little bit uh, later on. So. For the purpose of this talk, we're only discussing in-kernel users. Uh, user space boundaries are super important, but that's a big topic on its own. Uh, so we're not, uh, not discussing user space boundaries, a little outside of scope. And I'm leaving out, uh, uh, well, these are some common, common subsystems that you, you guys hopefully in the room have you know, worked with a few of these before. So these are examples of what we're talking about. I'm leaving out lots of stuff, block IO, um, TTY subsystem, networking devices, like huge, huge sections of stuff. But this is what I'm familiar with. This is what I work with day to day since I mostly work on ARM system on chips, waking up chips, and this list is sort of biased. So what makes a good subsystem? Um, it needs to solve the problem. Um, I kind of believe in the Pareto principle, the 80-20 split, you know, 20% of the effort solves 80% of the cases. Uh, you have to solve the problem for the common cases. It must be maintainable, and to be maintainable, the code has to be written well, but you also need uh, active maintainers. Um, people that are that are looking after the health of the subsystem. These days, everything's SMP, so it must be concurrent, have uh, locking correctness. A big one is respecting the driver model, and this sounds obvious, but there are many examples of where the driver model is not respected uh, in, in mainline code. Um, it needs to be architecture and platform independent, um, safe for modules, and then testing is often overlooked, especially for upstream stuff. Um, and so uh, um, continuous testing, whether it's integration with, you know, um, Linux Next, kernelci.org, or, or internal testing of some sort, and also merging tests into mainline is quite important. It's kind of worth pointing out that a framework is a toy until there's at least three consumers of it. You may think, oh, this is great stuff, but until there's at least three consumers, it, there are going to be big design flaws. Um, and also within that paradigm, you, you know, if all of the consumers are of the same platform, then it's probably not the most robust piece of code. 
once you move beyond having multiple platforms within an architecture using it, then having multiple architectures use a subsystem, these steps will increase the, the robustness of the, uh, of the subsystem. Oh, and then also a little pro tip is that, you know, if, if you end up authoring some new subsystem of some sort, go to a conference and buy beers for people and uh, convince them to uh, convert their drivers over to use your new framework. Beers are the way it's done. So. Um, Linux isn't really that special. You know, good programming practices solve most of the problems. Um, you know, write pretty code. That will solve a lot of problems. Um, consolidate code wherever you can. Um, uh, as a maintainer, you should be continuously scanning for open code solutions that are so somewhat common, factoring them to reusable blocks. Um, as a counterpoint to that, I'm also sort of anti-consolidation sometimes. Um, you know, provide helpers and accessor functions only as needed because, you know, don't over-engineer it. A lot of times I, I, I see this pattern where every single knob or every single function call is, is internal function is exposed through some API and that'll come back to bite you. If there's not a user for something, don't expose it. Um, use Coxinel to find bad patterns and fix them. It's a little bit of a pain to set up, but it's, it's worth it for sure. And if you're not familiar with algorithms and data structures, you know, read a book. All right, so this is the, the meat of the presentation. Um, we're going to go through a bunch of design considerations, sort of one by one. And here's the list of them. You know, the API split itself between consumer and providers. Um, the responsibilities of consumers, what, how much hardware do they need to know about. Sort of device versus resource, and you'll see what I mean there. And, uh, and down the line. So we'll go through these one by one. Any questions so far? Um, so one of the big things that you know uh, you need to design for at the, at the very outset is understanding who are the consumers and who are the provider drivers, and and splitting the API for that. And so you know on the consumer side, you want to get a resource and then make some changes to it. For the clock framework, this is typical: enabling the clock, <laughs> setting the rate, etc. On the provider side, you want to make the clock available to the rest of the Linux. Uh, drivers out there. So um, you want to register the clock, provide operations for it. Um, and this is a bit embarrassing, but I, I made the mistake of mixing some of these, not all of them, but I made the mistake of mixing some of these in the same header. This is totally confusing. You, know, you want to split this stuff up very strictly from the beginning, um, and uh, which you know, we've had for some time now, actually. But an important question is, you know, can providers and consumers be mixed safely? Can they be mixed in a, in a sane way? You know, is there a case where, where something is both a consumer and a provider? So that leads to our first real life example here. Um, Laurent is not here, he was here earlier, but uh, he wrote this uh, driver. Um, we have an example of a image signal processor driver, uh, which is merged upstream. And in this example, the ISP block, it consumes a clock. The, the CAM M clock is provided by a, uh, you know, something else, it's provided by a clock generation IP block. Um, but interestingly, interestingly enough, the ISP block also has its own clock knobs, which is, it exposes as a provider. And so this is a time when a, a single driver can be both a provider and a consumer, and the framework has to not fall over. It has to be able to, to do this sort of a thing. Um, and, uh, and also, one thing that we'll get into here is um, a little bit about whether or not a subsystem should create its own uh, struct devices, whether or not a Linux subsystem should, should create struct devices or whether it should act more like a library and just manage some resources. So in this case, it's really great that the, the, the clock framework, it's, it doesn't create any struct device ever. You have to bring your own device. You typically, if you are writing a, a clock uh, a provider driver, you will have a platform device. You may use syscon. You may, uh, you know, it may come from uh, some PMIC device, MFD sometimes. You bring your own device and then you just plug in. So this is an example of, of, a, of one way that that's actually done in an, in an upstream driver. So another important thing is to understand like what are, what are the burdens that the consumer drivers need to bear? Um, a consumer driver should never need to understand the details of the underlying hardware. This will not scale, right? I mean, it may work on one platform, but then once the same MMC controller driver or whatever is used on you know, several different platforms, it just totally breaks. And so one of the things that you want is to have a, a minimum amount of sort of platform knowledge have to get shoved into a consumer driver. And um, for the clock framework, what this means is we try to be really smart. 
Um, we do tons of tree walks. We try to, you know, figure out what the consumer driver wants when it calls clock set rate, for instance. Um, and we'll have a, I'll have a detail on that on the next slide. Uh, give you an example of how that actually works. And, um, you know, Stephen Boyd, uh, he's the co-maintainer um, of the clock framework. He once joked that we're putting an SAT solver into the kernel. If there's some computer science you know, nerds in here, you might find that funny. Um, but sometimes that's the right thing to do, to have that level of complexity in the kernel and make it easier on the consumers, right? You know, ease their burden uh, for using the API. And another thing, um, we'll get into this a bit later, but having an API which is very write-focused, not just not read-write, but where you basically, the consumer driver can request changes to state, but not necessarily read very much state back. That's uh, quite a helpful paradigm because if you are able, if you expose a lot of state to a, um, uh, to a consumer driver, that encourages that consumer driver author to, to put a lot of conditionals and to start hard coding a lot of state into their driver, which you know, doesn't scale. Again, it's the same problem as before, which is that you really want them to not have to know too much about the underlying hardware. So here's the MMC controller example I alluded to earlier. In this case, the, the MMC controller has a clock that it gets, and let's just say it wants to change the rate of that clock, you know? It should not care that maybe the MMC clock needs to switch its parent MUX, or maybe we need to propagate the rate change up to, um, you know, a, a PLL, which we'll have to relock. I mean, these are like platform-specific details that the, the controller does not care about at all. So in the case of the clock framework, we go really out of our way to try to make this very transparent for the MMC controller. And that's something that you, know, you should consider from the very outset of a subsystem design, which is you know, really where is the boundary? Like how much do, about the hardware does a consumer device need to know? And it's hard to, it's hard to get right. It, as many things here, it's, it's a matter of taste. But in our case, I mean, the, the clock code is pretty hairy. I mean, we, we try to solve as much of that problem you know, behind the scenes and under the hood as possible. So, um, but it makes it easy for the MMT controller. All he knows is, hey, I got one clock. I set its rate. I don't really care how it happens on the other, other side of the API. All right, our friend is back, the most interesting man in the world. So this is definitely a matter of taste the, the, on this slide, and this is something I alluded to before, which is sort of the, the question around, uh, are you managing devices or are you managing resources? And this took me a long time to get right. Um, I'll talk about the clock framework again here, which is that you know, we, we chose not to model clocks as devices. Now, you know, why? Sometimes it's just practical. On a single system on chip, you can have literally 100, like mo more than 200 clock nodes, right? Do we really want, you know, over 200, you know, sort of devices flying around? Is that, is that the right thing to do? And the way that those, you know, clock nodes are linked together is a tree structure that can change, you know? Do we really want to have a representation in SysFS with the directory structures changing on the fly if, if we're modeling the, the tree hierarchy? Does that make sense? Uh, it does not, but I didn't know that at first. And my initial submission did exactly that. It had, you know, a, an absolutely enormous footprint in SysFS um, where the, the, the directory structure could not be relied upon. It wasn't stable. And, and so, um, you know, after some time I came to realize that, you know, we don't really want to model clock objects. Now, this is an interesting comparison for those of you that are familiar with the regulator framework, which is kind of similar to the clock framework. You know, it's all power management related stuff. You need it to... You, you, it's one of the core things you need when you're enabling a new platform. On regulator framework, it's absolutely the right thing for struct regulator to have a device embedded inside of it. That makes perfect sense for them. There's fewer regulators to manage on a system, uh, and, it, and it just seems to fit their model better. It's a matter of taste. So, so this is you know the kind of decisions you'll grapple with when creating a uh, a subsystem from scratch. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. There's just um, taste, and this guy. All right, so moving right down the line for, you know, big, you know, big item topics is, is reference counting. You know, you have to have lots of reference counting for, for various reasons, but for module, you know, unloading uh, and reloading, uh, the two best ways to do that are with K-object and K-ref. And so, you know, this is going to help track your, you know, resources in the kernel and which one do you choose to work with? Well, if you're working with struct device, you get K-object for free. If you want representation in SysFS, you should be using uh, K-object. Um, but also, you can use KREF directly, which is in K-object, for those of you that aren't familiar with these, uh, these two types. 
And um, KREF is lighter weight. Uh, you do not have representation in, in SysFS with it. And this is what uh, we chose to go with. And so the, you know, the reason we need this is because we have uh, consumer drivers, which are taking references to clocks, which are provided by provider drivers. And then we also have dependencies between provider drivers themselves. This gets into module hell if, you're, if you don't design it right from the outset. You know, you have um, uh, resources which are disappearing out from underneath you when you unload, a, uh, let's say, a, a module which is a clock provider. And now, you know, consumer drivers still have references to clocks which, you know, you cannot control anymore because the, 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 the module that uh, manages them is gone. And so you, you know, you, you have to choose one or the other. And uh, again, it comes down to taste. It really comes down to how the, uh, how you are using the, uh, the driver model or the device model in Linux. Um, I mentioned earlier that the initial submission of the clock framework used K-Object and then we ended up migrating over to uh, K-Ref internally. Okay, this is my first uh, code example war story. So I chose this code because it doesn't really exist anymore. If you really wanted to, you could pickaxe your way or whatever and find it and get. But I chose it because it's, you know, the, the names have been you know, changed to protect the innocent. Um, so this code really sucks. Um, and the reason for that is because it's called from Arch code, not from driver. You know, we're initializing, we're initializing a, a clock provider here um, and you know, registering some fixed rate clock. You know, I didn't put very much code on the slide. Um, but it's called from Arch code, not from a driver. And then it's, it's also called from an init call. There is no Linux driver associated with this stuff. We are registering uh, clock, you know, uh, um, clock nodes with the clock library with the clock framework, but there's no driver at all associated with it. They're just sort of, you know, out there, right? Who's managing it? What are they doing with it? And, and you know, how did this happen? Because this got merged. So, so how is it possible for us to, you know, sort of have this situation? Well, it's all about context. This is sort of the war story aspect of it. You know, at the time that uh, the, the clock framework was uh, being merged in, there was a big push to just get it done because we were trying to enable single Z image or multi-platform boot on ARM, you know, device tree was, uh, was just being adopted right around that same time. And so for device driver authors for platforms like this, you know, they wanted to get the shortest path possible. They already had their own clock implementations. They just wanted it to work with the new, the new shiny subsystem with the shortest amount of, of you know, the shortest path possible, the least amount of work. So they just adapt the, the current code, which this code had always been doing this. There had never been a proper driver for it, never like a, a platform driver. Uh, and, um, and uh, th some of this stuff got merged, and we've cleaned up most of it in hindsight, but we have a few of these still lurking around. This is something that I wish I had been aware of uh, more so uh, in the early days, which is um, really focusing on making sure that everyone's converting to having a real proper Linux driver. It's, you know, it's something you take for granted, but it, it, it's also a, a real problem. Um, the real mistake I made was that I did not include a Linux uh, clock provider driver example. I wrote the framework and then I said, oh, you know, the, the code is the comments, you guys can just figure it out, you know? And the right thing to do is to provide like the cleanest, most, you know, uh, the best looking, prettiest possible example driver that you can if you're writing this new framework. You know, that give people a, a good idea of, of the right way to do it. Because if you just, you know, trust <coughs> everyone else to do it the right way, most of them will, but not all, so. Lesson learned. All right. Locking, kind of an important topic, gets one slide. Um, the first line there probably, probably explains most of it. You cannot trust drivers um, uh, that are, are using, you know, um, that are using your locks at all. Uh, they're totally untrustworthy. So um, how, do you, how do you make the, these uh, things sane? Strict entry points are one of the really important things. Don't expose any data structures that can be touched outside of a lock, um, that's just, pretty good, you know, programming fundamentals. Um, and then of course, you know, access to all data structures in a locking scheme. But there's a little more nuance uh, to that. Um, one of the mistakes I still see sometimes is that the lock objects themselves, a spin lock or mutex or whatever, is exposed to drivers. This is a pretty big mistake. You open yourself up to deadlocks that way. You know, access to the lock should be behind the entry points that you control, you know. Um, but I still see that one a lot. Um, if you expose your locks, the, the consumer drivers will, will deadlock you. 
right? And unless you're, you know, boot testing on every piece of hardware under the sun, you won't, you won't necessarily detect that. Um, and then um, drivers can have their own locks. If they really have some special needs, they can have their own locks. Uh, one of the things that we did early on in the clock framework was with these basic clock types to implement like very simple implementations of um, divider clocks and gates and things like that that everyone has to use. We provided hooks uh, that the platforms can plug into to provide their own locks. For, perhaps they have um, registers that a lot of different subsystems are accessing, right? And maybe they're not using RegMap. And so if they're not using uh, RegMap, they do need to have some lock so that they're not, you know, tromping on each other at the same time and, and you know, read, modify, write in the same register. So we provide hooks for that, but not the locks. The locks come from the drivers. So that's, that's one of the things we actually got right early on. Definitely don't expose your locks. And here's an example of, of a tricky locking situation um, and how we handled it. So... Um, in the clock framework, we have competing needs. Uh, one thing I haven't discussed yet is that the, the, the consumer API is quite old. Um, it predates the implementation of the common clock framework. It, it's been around for years. And in that legacy API, we have this clock enable and disable. Those can be called from interrupt context, and that's just the way the API has always been, um, for better or for worse. Um, but in real hardware, some of the ops might sleep or take a long time. Imagine a PLL relocking and having to settle down, something like that. So these are at odds with each other. So a clock prepare and awesomely named clock unprepare, um, those were added to the API, the consumer API, to supplement uh, the, the enable and disable. So we use a mutex for the prepare and a spin lock for the enable ops. The only way to make this sane is just to have strict rules around it because we're, we're mixing locks at this point. Um, we have uh, uh, consumer drivers have to call these in order, prepare and then enable and then disable and then unprepare. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the preceding call must always complete before the next call is finished. There's not a great way to automate checking for this stuff. A lot of this comes down to review. You just have to make sure that the drivers are, uh, the consumer drivers are never violating this rule. As long as they don't violate this rule, you'll be fine. But um, this is one of those... Uh, uh, solution is somewhat simple, but at the, at the time, coming up with a, a scheme that was sane was, was, was somehow difficult. All right. Second war story where I, I blew up Linux. So in this case, we totally broke uh, I2C. And uh, what we have here is we have our food device. Everyone knows what food device does. And um, it consumes a clock. That clock is provided by this... The, the top gray block there, which is, you know, maybe a, a PMIC or an I2C clock expander. Now, this PMIC also has its own clock that, uh, that it uses, this, uh, you know, this uh, crystal or whatever, this external crystal. So what happens when food device calls clock enable on, I, on I2C out clock? Um, we try to enable that clock, which results in entering the I2C subsystem, the I2C subsystem, nice and generic code. Um, it, you eventually hit the I2C transfer function, well, I2C transfer calls clock enable on the clock that it needs, right? Deadlock. And so this was a very common case in which, like, basically we, all of I2C broke um, due to our locking scheme. And we had to fix it pretty quickly. So um, you know, how do we do that? How do we get rid of the deadlock? Well, there's a lot of different ways to solve it. But in this case, what we did was uh, we <coughs> added reentrancy to the clock framework. Kind of like a gross, not so nice reentrancy, but it works. Um, and so for the, if you are in the same context and trying to uh, acquire the same lock, then we allow you to just bypass the lock. And the implementation is, is here. I've wondered if this code is useful enough, this kind of implementation is useful enough to be merged into some generic helper. But, you know, we, we basically use the um, current thread info uh, task member. And if that's the same, uh, if, if we try to hold the lock and the lock is held, but the guy holding the lock is us, from, the, uh, from the, the, the current thread info, then we just keep going. We just bypass the lock and keep going. I've wondered if this is useful to other people. It's, it's just in our private code right now. But this gives us reentrancy, very, very, very limited reentrancy um, to handle cases like the I2C uh, case. So this is a, a very real problem that we ran into. And no, 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 I, I mean, I haven't yet. I haven't even tried. But, but I know, but I mean, this is, this is a problem that, you know, others must have uh, from time to time. So. Is there a question?
So this is a this is actually I probably should have put this slide uh, earlier on. It's quite important. I asked a bunch of you know subsystem maintainers and authors for advice on this talk, and I think this was the the one piece that almost every single email I received back highlighted, which is protecting your data structures and your bookkeeping. This is sort of like not exposing your locks to drivers because drivers are are crazy. <laughs> so um, what you need to do is, you know, don't expose any bookkeeping at all. People will muck with it. And there's some interesting examples in the kernel where we have um, data structures that now being able to touch things you shouldn't touch is a de facto behavior. And we'll probably be stuck with it forever. Uh, or until someone does like massive rewrites. And so avoid that from the very outset. You know, use opaque handles where, you know, the, 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 the drivers cannot dereference the pointer. And this thing, this seems pretty... Uh, Basic stuff, but but I see this this is wrong all the time. Um, if you are going to give you know some kind of driver access, think long and hard about if you really need to, or or if you can limit um, what kind of data structures they can uh, dereference and have access to. And um, of course, reference count all the accesses so that you can have a sane module <coughs> functionality. But this is I can't stress this point enough. It's usually pretty easy to implement, but. Um, People, when they're writing code, they just tend to think, oh, if I make everything, you know, it's all in kernel. It's all in kernel. It's all trusted, right? Like, we're, we're all going to get along. But you, you really can't trust the drivers that are consuming the code that you write. So um, kind of moving on to the reference counting uh, discussion. So um, on, the, on the right side of the screen, we have, like, the old monolithic struct clock, which did global use counting. Um, at the very bottom, you can see the enable count and the prepare count. And um, this was fine. It, it, it works just fine. Um, it lets you know if use counts get out of whack at a global level. But you have no clue um, what driver will have made you get out of, you know, uh, what, what driver was, was acting badly and, and messed up the use counts. And um, eventually we introduced on the left side a, uh, a wrapper structure, which is um, now dedicated to each user. So for each user of a clock, each uh, driver that consumes a clock, we allocate a new struct clock. And we have our own, uh, in the red there, we have our own uh, reference counts dedicated specifically to that user. And this is a design pattern that's it's really helpful for debugging. Now you can know exactly when a specific user screws up uh, uh, the... Uh, the reference counting directly and you know, oh, this is the driver that messed it up. So this is a small little tip, but it's something that, that helps a lot with debugging and trying to uh, uh, verify correctness of um, you know, sort of downstream drivers. Oh, and for a, a weird bit of history, um, going back one slide, I was, I was talking about how you need to protect data structures and bookkeeping. On the right side, that structure used to be exposed in a header that was cunningly named clock-private.h with a huge comment block that said, you're not allowed to include this header. Um, but of course, some people did. So eventually we were able to, uh, it, that was for legacy reasons. That, there, there, was some, there were technical reasons to do that in the early days. But after two years, we were finally able to update all of the users of, of uh, the clock framework to not need that. And after a two-year Herculean effort, we were able to um, move all of this stuff into a C file that's not exposed at all via a header. So, that, you know, there's exceptions to all the rules. Sometimes you have to make a bad design choice. But the important thing is to revisit it and, uh, and clean it up when you can. All right, git put abuse. This should never happen. This happens all the time. Uh, you see this sort of thing where, you know, you get a resource, you do something with it, you put the resource, but you keep the, you keep the pointer around and, you know, uh, and, and, and call a function on it when you, the reference counting is now out of whack. And um, I, I didn't want to write all the code on the on this slide, but you often see this in loops. You'll have a, a loop where you're getting resources and iterating and trying to match a resource on some conditional and putting the resources as you go. And there's a small logical flaw there where um, you will then, you know, keep the reference to something that you put. I don't want to put the loop on the slide. But this is very, very common and it's nuts to look at it. I mean, this should, this should never happen, but it's all over the place. So uh, Coxinelle is good for this. Um, and there's some other things you can do to try to catch it programmatically. But this also often just comes down to review. The uh, per user, um, the per user reference counting that I mentioned uh, on the last slide, uh, will also help resolve or not resolve. But it'll help catch this at runtime more efficiently. So do that if you can. You get some of this stuff for free if you're using K object or K ref in the traditional way with a struct device. Uh, 
Otherwise, if you're like the clock framework and you're implementing some of this on your own, you, you have to be careful. And then finally, this is we're getting near the end of the design, uh, uh, the design guide here. You know, a, a, a subsystem can be you know synchronous or asynchronous behavior with respect to its consumer API. This is um, it's both hard and easy. Uh, this decision a lot of times start with sync, and then if you need better performance um, for um, if you don't want to block on the CPU side, then you can use async. Um, but sometimes it's not really correct. So, for instance, uh, on the clock framework, it, it's almost always incorrect to have an asynchronous behavior. Like if you say, if, if your driver wants to do something like, you need to enable a clock so that, uh, to an interconnect so that I can write to some registers, you know? It would be totally incorrect to have an asynchronous clock enable and then touch that register before the clock's enabled. You know, you'll get some kind of data aboard across the internet, in an interconnect or something. So, you know, for some subsystems, especially I.O. related ones, async is awesome. But it's a, it's a, desi it's a design decision you can often defer to later on. Um, you can always add async later on if you want. But it's a, it's a, big, it's a big decision to, to make. And then finally, um, this is one we're dealing with more and more and more. Um, in the embedded world, we used to have all these big nasty board files where people would stuff a bunch of um, platform data and other stuff. And we've tried to move to device tree. And then of course there's other stuff, there's ACPI where um, that spec is constantly evolving and there's more and more different types of hardware description being shoved into ACPI. So you have to consider where does the data come from um, when you're when you're registering these uh, these provider drivers for the, the the subsystem, and the nice thing is to provide um, helper functions as much as possible for this. Otherwise, what you get is a bunch of open code solution in in drivers where people are you know iterating through tables or trying to like parse some stuff, and they're all doing the same thing, but they're all doing it slightly different and sometimes wrong. So um, you know, provide helper functions as much as possible. Um, but don't design with a single firmware interface in mind. You know, this stuff is supposed to be generic. You want to keep the Linux specific bits Linuxy, which is a real world, real word. And then um, you want to, you know, have a separation layer where you can talk to different types of firmware solutions to, to get your data. And finally, you know, we just have miscellaneous tips and uh, some pitfalls. Um, you know, do a lot of mo module unload and reload testing to look for, you know, uh, memory leaks in the actual core framework itself. Um, this is super embarrassing for me, but um, one of the mistakes I made early on was I had some, you know, generic functions, which, you know, they took two arguments, no big deal. And feature creep over time started passing more and more arguments and, you know, just, just, just pass, you know, pointers to structures in from the very beginning and save yourself the trouble of having to refactor a ton of code when you have expanding argument lists. Uh, do merge tests into mainline. Hide them behind, you know, some kconfig option. Um, there's more and more tests always being merged upstream, but it's one of those things where I think that we're not doing the, the best job. We, can, we should definitely have more tests. Um, you can reduce makefile uh, uh, collisions. Um, you know, instead of appending everything to the bottom of the makefile, which everyone wants to do, you know, sort it somehow. And that last point is very nitpicky, but it does make your diffs a little better. Yes. <clears throat> Would it be better to use KREF or not KREF for that? Well, so no. A lot of times, what you're what you're doing is you might create a struct on the stack and point it uh, and pass it in, right? I mean, it's I don't know if it's I don't know if the KREF or K object thing plays in here. It's just the fact that, you know, if you have a consumer um, facing API and let's say there's uh, 40 drivers that are implementing this thing, right? If you make a change to that argument list, you have to go and refactor all of those drivers, right? So you can just do yourself a big favor by passing in a struct instead that makes that a lot easier, right? Um, a lot of times the drivers that aren't using the new feature can just ignore it, no update required for them whatsoever. So it's just about making it less noisy to introduce changes or new features into the core framework. So. Any other questions before we go on to a couple of examples? So, um, so we're, we're nearing the end. So uh, a, a little bit of background on the clock framework. Um, the, the API that it implements is, is quite old. It, it predates the, the, the implementation of the, of the common clock framework quite a bit. Um, and uh, 
It's, the API is only the consumer side of the API. It's, it, it, never, it never stated at all how to create a Linux device driver that implements a clock driver, implements a clock provider. Um, and then to make things even more confusing, there's this, uh, the, the, the part where you get the clock uh, and put the clock is something separate called clock dev, which is handled like by another API. So it's, it's, it's super great. And um, there's multiple implementations of the clock.h API, even today um, on PowerPC and in MIPS and in ARM, there's, um, there's, there's totally uh, independent implementations for this API. Now those cannot be combined into a single image, right? Because they're all defining you know, the same structures differently. Um, so if you want, the reason we implemented the common clock framework was so that we could have these multi-platform images where we shove, you know, maybe hundreds of different platforms into one giant uh, uh, binary image. Um, and also increases code consolidation, increases reuse, and hopefully when we fix one bug somewhere, it fixes it for everybody. So a lot of, a lot of reasons to do this. This happened at the same time as some other developments, you know, the pin control and pin mux, um, by uh, Linus Wallage was going on, which is somewhat analogous, trying to solve a similar set of problems. Um, and also the device tree uh, adoption for ARM was happening at this time, which made it really interesting because everyone was trying to figure out how to craft a, a decent device tree binding at the same time they were trying to create these new unified frameworks. So it was, it was, it was fun times. Um, so the whole design of the framework in one slide is, you know, it's a library. I mentioned earlier, you know, these frameworks, I, I use the word framework a lot of times when the framework's creating a struct device and a library when you bring your own struct device, but you're just managing some resource. So CCF is, you have to bring your own, bring your own platform device or bring your own platform driver. Um, and uh, it's just a library for managing uh, the, the, the clock tree hierarchy globally. Um, we used a, a mixture of mutexes and spin locks. The, the consumer API clearly defines the expected behavior here. Um, it's hard to enforce that programmatically, but you know, uh, documentation and, and review is key here. Um, we're using opaque handles. There's almost nothing, there is basically nothing that, con that consumer and provider drivers can, uh, can dereference. Uh, they can't see any of the bookkeeping at all. Um, and we use per user reference counting to, uh, to, to catch bugs uh, quite quickly. There's a strict consumer provider API split, which there wasn't always. We've had to go back and refactor a lot of code to do that. Um, the internal data structures are all hidden. We use big global locks for everything. Um, someday we may revisit that and have some fine-grained locking for uh, perhaps better performance. Um, but uh, it's, it's you know, not on our radar at all right now. Uh, there is no async API. For this, it's a matter of taste. For this type of hardware that you're working with, it often doesn't make any sense to have an asynchronous interface to, to changing uh, the state of some uh, clock signal. And interestingly enough, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the API itself is shared with competing implementations. So we're not free to just go into clock.h and just change whatever we want because we're going to break a bunch of platforms on MIPS, PowerPC, and, and ARM that are, they're maybe old um, and maybe no one's actually booting them, but you know, you can't do that. So we're actually constrained in some ways in what we're allowed to do, um, which presents us with some interesting problems. The final thing, oh, is any, any questions? Because we're, we're on the final part here about maintenance. So. Okay. So um, let's say you've, you know, you've absorbed the, all of the stuff in this slide. You've written your, uh, your new subsystem. People like it. It's been through a bunch of, you know, it's on version 329 and it finally gets merged. And um, now what? So merging some new piece of code where uh, other Linux driver authors are going to plug into it. That is just the beginning. It is not the end. And it's very important to stress that because there is this phenomenon where companies will throw code over a wall. You know, they'll, they'll, even, they'll even go through the effort of doing multiple revisions on the mailing list, but there's no follow through, right? They don't want to maintain it. They don't want to continue to shepherd the health of the subsystem going forward. So it's important to stress that getting something merged is just the very beginning. Um, and um, I found it for a, for me personally, um, I found I ended up in the beginning having to set aside 50% of my work time to maintain this thing, which is way more than what I thought it would be. And I think it's common to underestimate. Uh, it's another feedback I got from a bunch of maintainers. It's very common in the early days to underestimate how much time uh, you think you'll need to spend with a, with a new piece of code that a lot of people are interested in. You're going to be getting tons of bug fixes, tons of new driver ports to review. And in the early days, you need to review basically every line 
uh, very, very closely because you're setting precedents and setting um, examples that other driver authors will use. Once you have some really nice uh, uh, drivers which are using the framework, then you can sort of say, oh, look at how those guys did it, you know, and, and, and follow their example. But you need to have good examples first. And how to maintain your sanity is, is quite important. So um, finding a co-maintainer is something I wish I had done probably a year before I did it. Um, my solution to this was pretty simple. Uh, I went through all the people that were um, doing the, the top contributions, not just to the drivers, but to the core framework code itself. Um, and uh, you know, I, I approached a, a couple of them about that. And you need to talk to people. You don't have to have the same worldview. You don't have to both like long walks on the beach, you know, the same sports teams. None of that's important. But what's important is that you can have a clear line of communication with this person. You, know, that you, uh, you don't have to agree on everything, but as long as you don't talk past each other and have communication issues, pick someone that's a top contributor, ask them if they'll help. People are pretty friendly. A lot of times they will. And that, that, that's just having, you know, going from one maintainer to two is, is enormously helpful. And of course, there's some, you know, there's, a lot of times where you get three or more maintainers, maintainers for a, a specific bit of code. Um, setting up a mailing list or IRC channel, I, I get mixed reviews on this one. I like it because for me it helps filter out the noise. I also think that uh, if you have a dedicated mailing list, you tend to get the people that sign up to that list are somehow motivated to do more review. And um, that sort of helps, you, you know, having one person doesn't have to do all of the review, you know, get the community's help on that. Some people don't like this. Some people want everything on LKML. Whatever. Um, and then, yeah, automating everything. So I realized after watching Greg's uh, talk yesterday, like I have a lot, a long way to go towards automating my workflow. But, um, you know, at the very minimum, your sort of patch review and application process should be as automated as possible. Um, and then if you can automate your coffee machine or something like that, that'll probably help. So it's my favorite slide. Most interesting man in the world is back. So, um, the primary function, once you're starting to maintain some code, is to say no. Uh, and, um, you know, that doesn't mean say no to everything, but the point is, is that your job is not to say yes. Your job is to say no. Uh, and, um, uh, in fact, you may get so busy saying no or, or just reviewing and giving feedback that in time you may not even be the top contributor for some code that you wrote, um, which is uh, an interesting position to be in. Um, oh, I think I misspelled May. Um, and, and, and that's okay. That's not a problem at all. Um, once you get more people involved, you get a different perspective. A lot of changes and bug fixes come in. Um, it's, it's what you want for the health of the subsystem. And, um, and I also want to point out that, you know, it's okay to say no to a patch, even if you don't have the strongest technical reason for it. Sometimes if you're deeply familiar with the code, you may have a gut feeling. You may just think, well, let's just hold off on a merge window, which no driver author ever wants to hear, right? Everyone's like, oh, I, I did the work, let's just merge this thing, you know? And the, you know, you don't have a good technical reason to not merge it. But I would say that there have been plenty of times where I've held off on something without having a strong reason for it, and I'm, like, 100% of the time, I'm, I'm glad that I did. Uh, you know, you gain clarity over time on, um, on why you shouldn't, why you held off on that patch, and uh, perhaps an alternative solution comes up, which is much more elegant. So that's, that's something I would strongly encourage for people in this position. So I want to thank uh, these four people and then lots of other people who didn't make the slide for their help. Um, these folks, you know, gave me uh, feedback on the on some of the, the top tips for when you're authoring a subsystem. Um, and uh, that's all for me now. I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. So. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, this one. Say no part. Mm. 
Our individual profile of the story of how you said, yes, it's important for me. So, That's the way I that's the way I feel about it. Yeah. And that's also why the most interesting man in the world is on this slide because this is, you know, just my opinion. It's it's, uh, it's certainly a controversial point of view. Um but yeah, I, I think that it's I think it's better to to merge something in time than it is to, you know, do a revert um uh later on, but that's just that's only my opinion. And to your first point about um not being the top contributor, um that, that, that's true for me. I, I'm no longer, I mean, in terms of lines of code for each merge window, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm probably not even the top contributor for, for the past year on the clock framework, you know, so, which is, I think, a, a healthy sign. <coughs> so, some other people being involved. So. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Finding a co-maintainer is very important. So. Yeah. Nothing else. All right. Thanks.